This will be the song for our announcements and prayer. One A. So. Good morning. This is Elijah Gilbert speaking for the Church of Christ. We welcome each of you to our worship service. We appreciate our radio and TV audience and invite you to worship with us whenever possible. Our building is located at 4th and Magnolia in South Pittsburgh. Our visitors are asked to fill out a visitor's card located on the back of the pew. Please drop this in the collection plate when it is passed. We meet each Sunday at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. for worship. We have Bible classes for all ages following our morning worship service. We also meet on Wednesday at 7 p.m. For Bible study. The purpose of the Church of Christ is to uphold the Bible as the Word of God and to exalt Christ as the Son of God. We urge all to become Christians in the New Testament way. A CD or DVD of today's sermon is available free upon request by calling 423-837-6088. The opening prayer today will be led by Robert Ritchie. Our speaker and song leader today is Ron Gilbert, and the closing prayer will be led by Sam Durham. Other announcements are November 8th through the 12th will be the Gospel Meeting in Whitwell. December the 6th will be the Holiday Dinner after Evening Service. Group 3 is in charge. November the 28th, Saturday, there will be a Teacher's Meeting at 9.30 a.m. Check the bulletin for a list of the sick of the congregation and please add the following. Delia Russell has been diagnosed with shingles. Also, we have a thank you card which reads, Dear family, thank you so much for the love shown to me during my heart surgery and recovery. Thank you for all the cards and prayers. I am getting uh, stronger every day. Continue to remember me in your daily prayers. Thanks again, Miss Betty Jean Cloud. We will now have our opening prayer. You bow with me, please. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we thank you for this day. Another chance to come here and sing songs of praise and hear a lesson from your word. Father, mostly we thank you for the love of Jesus and the life he came to earth and lived to give us an opportunity to have a home in heaven when we leave this place. Father, we'd ask that you'd be with the sick, especially Sister Russell, help her to recover and be back with us. We ask you to be with the missionaries, soldiers that travel around the world that defend our right to worship you and, and to spread your word throughout the world. Father, we know that when we walk in this world, we do things that we shouldn't do and and we know that when we have a pure heart and, and, and come back to you, that you'll be willing to forgive us and, and put us back in that fold. Father, we'd ask that you bless the elders here and bless Brother Ron as he brings lessons to us from time to time. Give him a ready recollection and a long life in thy service, Father. We ask that as we go on down through this service and on down through life, that we do only the things that would be pleasing unto thee, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. care to mark your song books to page 89 89 that'll be our song of invitation this morning so, uh, song 89 after you've marked that if you'd like to open your song books to page 141 100 
41. Good evening. Good evening. Whoo, boy, I'm behind. Good morning, brethren. Good to see everybody. My family were kind enough to bring me my glasses, but uh, I am not having much uh, luck getting used to that bifocal thing, so I think I'm just going to go blind this morning. I can't see you, so if you feel tired, you can go ahead and close your eyes. I'll never know, but maybe I'll be able to read the screen. We're looking at our third lesson in a series of lessons that we've been looking at on that you may believe. That you may believe was the reason that the book of John was written. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, John chapter 20, verse 30. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christos, the Christ, and that believing the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. We looked at the prologue, verses uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through 18, and we talked about the various relationships that Jesus has. First of all, to deity, that he was God, and in the beginning was with God, and that he is God. Then we looked at his relationship to creation, the physical world, the moral world, his relationship to darkness, his relationship to man as creator and also benefactor. We also looked at his relationship to his father, that and he took on flesh and dwelt among men, verse 14, and then last but not least, least grace and truth and his relationship to that. Two weeks ago, we looked at the fact that Jesus claims, he has claims that he's the son of God. He came from God was one of his claims. As you know, in the seven I am's of the book of John, the first one we read is in John chapter 6, verse 35, when he says, I am the bread of heaven. And he says, Moses didn't give you that bread, but God gave you that bread. And now, you know, take advantage of the bread he's given you now, and I am that bread. So he came from God. He said that he alone had seen God. And that, of course, Moses and all those others we thought talked about having seen God, we realized those were theophanies. That is, God in manifesting himself in the presence where man could see. Because we know that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And Jesus said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we realize God is a spirit and that we can't see him in this life. Also, he said he knew God. Remember, we draw the distinction there between just knowing somebody and the idea of gnosko 
and the idea of complete knowledge in oinos. Now, we did say that you could use those words interchangeably, uh, and it wouldn't be a big deal. But when you stick them in the same sentence, obviously he's drawing a distinction that you don't know God, gnosko, but I know God, anoida. He's saying complete knowledge. And then, in fact, of course, he reveals God. John chapter 14 at verse 9, he says to Philip, you know, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, the icon. He is the icon of God. And then last but not least, that he is equal with God. John chapter 10, verse 35, I and my Father are one. So with this week, we're going to look at Jesus' claims to the messianic hope. A hope cherished by the Jews in Christ's day. You remember Anna said, you know, <laughs> But I get to see the, the Christ. You know, she had been promised as well as an, another fellow that they would not see death until they had seen the hope of Israel. And, of course, the hope of Israel, Jesus was the Messiah, the one that they had been looking for. And yet we'll see and have seen and you understand and know that the very ones who claimed to be the leaders of that group of folks that were looking for the Christ rejected him. It's a hope that Jesus claimed to have fulfilled. Notice in John 4, 24, or 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah. Notice that's capitalized. Notice she's saying that Messiah cometh. We're looking for the one, the anointed, and we'll look at that in just a moment, which is called Christos. Messiah being the Hebrew word, Christos or Christ being the Greek word. When he has come, he will tell us all things. And notice what Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am. The he, of course, is in italics. It is provided by the King James translators. Jesus says, I am the one that you have been looking for. The Messianic hope. The Old Testament concept of the Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach. And uh, in the Greek, it would be Christos. But we read it Christ. And in the Old Testament, we read the anointed. And so uh, we don't see those words in our English in the Old Testament, it is used as an adjective to describe what has taken place to or a characteristic of or an adjective of the ones that are anointed. Notice in Leviticus 4, 3, if the priest that is anointed. No, it's an adjective describing <clears throat> how he's become priest. He is anointed. Leviticus 8, 12. And he poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. So they're used as adjectives, but we also find it as nouns. You remember the whole time poor old David, excuse me, is being chased around the wilderness, the empty place, the barren place, and Saul's chasing him. David has opportunity to uh, end Saul's life, if you will. But David would time and time against, uh, uh, again would ask, how can I raise my hand against the Lord's anointed? See, they're used as a noun. Prophets. Priests and kings were anointed with oil. That's in the distinction in the Old Covenant. Notice 1 Samuel 24 at verse 6. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's. Notice all caps there. It's talking about God's covenant name, Jehovah's anointed. To stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing, his, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. 2 Samuel 2, 4. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. So he's going to go and bless them as a result of what they did for the Lord's anointed. Notice the concept that's developed in the Old Testament, beginning with Moses and going through the book of Zechariah. Moses will develop the idea that Christ is the prophet. I'll tell you what, we have that on the next slide. David will talk about the Messiah, the anointed one, being God. He will talk about him being king, Psalms 110, which is referenced by Peter in his first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. Also will reference him as priest, Psalms 110 again. Isaiah would talk about Emmanuel, God is with us, the king of kings, Lord of lords. Micah would refer to the king as well as the shepherd. Jeremiah would speak of Christ as the king, as the savior. And then Zechariah would speak of Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, as both king and priest. Beginning with Moses, Deuteronomy 18, 15. If you don't have this underlined in your Bible, it would be a great thing to do. Because uh, a lot of times you might be thinking, well, what's this talking about? Here's one of those places you don't have to guess. The King James translators will even capitalize it for you. Notice the Lord, all caps, that's Jehovah. 
God's covenant name, the tetragrammaton as we call it. It's four letters, Y-H-W-H. Some people pronounce it Yehwah or Yahweh. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophetes in the Greek, uh, uh, Navim in the Hebrew, a prophet, one who speaks for another. And notice that that word prophet is capitalized because this is speaking of the Christ. From the midst of thee unto thee, unto thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. Verse 17, and the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up. A, notice that word was capitalized again, a prophet. From among their brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. In other words, God says, you're going to listen to this fellow. If not, you're going to be in trouble. The messianic concept is developed. Jesus' day, people were anticipating a prophet. They were looking for him. Notice John chapter 1, verse 19. Now, you know we've just finished the prologue. Verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1 is the, the prologue, the beginning of. And then we have Jesus' private ministry, which begins with the description of and John the Baptist, the immerser who was going to be the one preparing the way. Notice, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, just exactly who are you? And notice who's been sent. Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem. I mean, this is the hierarchy. It's as high as it goes on the totem pole. They sent them to go find out who this fellow is that's causing this ruckus out here in the wilderness. He's out there baptizing people. The all of Jerusalem is flocking out there to see him. Well, who is he? Verse 20. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christos. I am not the Messiah. I'm not the anointed one that you're looking for. And they asked him, what then art thou Elijah? Now, that seems like a particularly odd question for us. Why would they ask him if he was Elijah? Elijah the Tishbite? There's no Ahab around. Why would they think that, you know, Elijah has been resurrected? I mean, what's up, what's up with that? And he saith, I am not. Art thou the prophet, or art thou that prophet? Notice that, very specific. And he answered, no. Well, why would they ask him that? In the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, of course, next to the last verse in all of the Old Testament, Malachi writes, says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. It is very customary today, even at Jewish feasts in this very day. Maybe not today, but you know what I mean, this, uh, this year or this age. They will leave a chair empty at their table when they celebrate, celebrate different religious feasts, waiting for Elijah the Tishbite to come. Because, see, they're looking for him before the Christ. Remember what Jesus' disciples asked him, said, Lord, why, why, why do they keep asking this? And Jesus said, for those who can receive it, John was that prophet or was the one that was to come before him. John the immerser, and they understood that. And he says, notice, Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The Messianic concept began with Moses and was continued in David. He spoke of the anointed one as God and everlasting. Notice Psalms 45, verses 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. One to be raised up. His kingdom would last forever. Notice he was spoke of the one that would be king and priest. Now, this is so significant. If you don't have this written down in your Bibles or make a note of it, I don't know how you do things like that. Me, I have to write it in there. But Psalms 110 is a direct reflection on what we find in Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 when discussing the branch. Notice David begins this psalm. And by the way, this is quoted in the first gospel sermon we find in Acts chapter 2. A psalm of David, notice the covenant name of God, the Lord Yahweh, however you want to say that, the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, the Lord said unto him, notice that. It's not that big caps lock, so it's not God talking to himself. You have the covenant name of God, one member of deity speaking to my Lord. And David is writing this, and remember, that's the question that David poses to the Jews in Matthew chapter 22. They said, uh, he said, who is the Christ or the anointed one? And they said, he is the son of David. And that's when David, uh, Jesus turns the table and says, okay. Then how can he in the spirit, notice the inspiration of the Bible, Jesus says that David wrote this in the spirit. In other words, he was inspired of God. 
How did he and the Spirit call him Lord? You see, daddies didn't call their sons lords. As a matter of fact, that'd be the opposite of the pecking order. Uh, children were subservient to their parents. And remember, that was this outstanding thing that uh, was taking place in Joseph's life. You remember his brother said, do you think, remember he saw the sheaves uh, bow down to him? You know, and his brother said, you think we're going to worship you? You remember when he added one? Added two, actually. And Jacob picked up on that and said, are me and your mama going to worship you too, son? And the bottom line was, yes, that was exactly what was going to take place. Joseph was going to be raised up high in the government of Egypt. And so that's exactly what took place. Well, you know, that was a surprise for Jacob. He's like, what? You know, the father doesn't worship the son. But notice, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstools. And that's when Peter would say, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. And continues with that gospel sermon. David is talking about the Lord God, talking about one whom he is going to sit at his right hand. On the right hand is to rule with. Notice verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of, the youth, uh, dew of thy youth. Notice verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that had to be confusing. That had to be confusing for those Jews. Because you see, their kings came through the Davidic line, the line of David or the tribe of Judah. Just as it was said in Genesis chapter 50 when uh, Jacob is blessing the sons and he says the scepter, the line of Judah, he's talking to Judah. He says the scepter, you know, the rule, the power shall not leave the house of Judah until the Shiloh come. Talking about the Christ. So... They're looking for a king, and yet David in this psalm is talking about that king being priest. Well, that's exactly what we find in Zechariah. And see, that was Christ's role as both prophet, priest, and king. He was going to be a priest and a king. And they're like, now, wait a minute. Our priests come from Levites. In order to be the high priest, you've got to be from the tribe of Aaron. How in the world can that take place? That's why the Hebrew writer will explain that very well for us, saying because there was a change of the law, there had to be a change of the priesthood as well. And so when the old law was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2 at verse 14 at Calvary, and Jesus died for the new covenant, Hebrews 9, 16, and 17, the New Testament, the new will came into effect, and Jesus was a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, that uh, priest that we read about in Genesis chapter 14. This is expanded, this idea, by the prophets. Notice Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Hmm. Now that should have caused them for a moment. A child is born, a son is given. They were looking for that king. But notice how this king is described. Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, hold on, we ain't done. The everlasting Father. Now how in the world could you use that to describe an earthly king? You see, they didn't see the Messiah and the implications that were there. He was going to be God. Chapter 9, verse 7, And the increase of his government and peace shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. So there's no doubt who this is talking about. He is talking about the king, but at the same time, he is talking about how this king is going to be a priest and God and be called the eternal father. Micah develops the idea of king and a shepherd. Micah 5.2. I love this verse. It's, if you don't have this marked in your Bibles, I would, because it's one of those verses that just screams of the inspiration of the Bible. It's also one of those verses that talks about the Christ and how that he is an answer and a fulfillment to prophecy. You see, our liberal friends, those who don't believe that the Bible is the word of God and don't believe in predictive prophecy and things of that nature, will attack the Bible and say there's no way that a man can predict 200 years out, 1,000 years out, 500 years out, 
what's going to take place? We know that's not so. We know that Jesus was talking, or God was talking about the Christ in Genesis chapter 3 at verse 15. 4,000 years before Christ would be born, there is predictive prophecy. And if you don't believe that and, and you try to fight that, this verse is going to be a death knell to your argument. The reason we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that at least 250 years before the Christ, this was in the Bible. We know that for an absolute can't get over it fact, even though we believe as Christians, as Bible believers, that Micah wrote this hundreds of years before the Christ. I mean by that over 500. Here, we know that this was in the verse 250 years before the Christ because we have a book called the Septuagint. A lot of times it's referred to as capital L, capital X, capital X, which is just simply the Roman numerals for 70 because that's the number of Hebrew scholars that translated the scriptures from Hebrew into Greek in a city by the name of Alexandria. They completed that work between 325 A.D. and 250 A.D. And so we know for sure, because you know what the Septuagint says here? The same exact thing this says. So if they want to fight it, say, well, it couldn't be 500 years old. Okay, how far out does predictive uh, prophecy have to be? This is at least 12 generations, at least, before the Christ would be born. Where it says, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata. Don't want you to mess it up. Not only does it say Bethlehem, but it gives you the area, the county, if you will. Now, I say county. didn't have counties. But that's how we would describe it. Uh, if I would say, well, you know, let's take a ride over to Pikeville. Well, you might say, well, let's go to Pikeville, Alabama. I hear they have good hamburgers there. Well, another fellow might say, well, no, I'm talking about Pikeville, Kentucky. And yet another fellow might say, well, I was just talking about right up the valley here north. I want to go get some of those ribs at Pig and Catch. Let me tell you something. They're worth going to get. But anyway, uh, there's three Pikevilles within driving distance of here and not even a couple of hours. So in order to make it specific, we might say, well, Pikeville up in Bledsoe County, Tennessee, well, that's what's happened here. You see, God don't want anybody to mess this up. Not only does he give you the name of the town, but he gives you the area because there's more than one Bethlehem in uh, the Old Testament. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto thee, that is to, unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And he has noticed this, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Man, put that together. Somebody's going to be born in Bethlehem that has roots that go all the way forever, from the beginning. Micah 5, 4, and he shall stand and feed the, uh, he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. I like the, uh, the uh, uh, American Standard New King James a little bit better here because it says, and he shall stand and shall feed his flock in the strength of Jehovah. And I think that's a little bit more where that language is going. than uh, That's one of the things when you're trying to translate a, an ancient language or any language really into another language especially like Greek or Hebrew. The Hebrews, of course, read right to left. They read from back to front. Uh, and like Greek, they're not real concerned where all their verbs and adjectives and things go. In fact, uh, I heard a fellow one time, he was, uh, he was a Chinese, and he was kind of uh, poking fun at his own culture. And I thought, well, boy, that's applicable to, to uh, Spanish. That's applicable to Greek because he was saying, you want to know how come they're always going, oh, oh, like that? is because the, all that takes place happens at the end. He says, so everybody's waiting <laughs> till they finish the sentence so you can figure out what they've been talking about the whole time. That's the same way here. And so simply here, this is just an easier way, I believe, to say the, what's being said here. He shall stand and shall feed his flock in the strength of Jehovah. Notice Jeremiah developed this idea as, as well as king and savior. He says, behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteous in the land. Verse 6, in his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called Jehovah, our righteousness. Notice Jeremiah develops as king and notice he'll be the savior. Judah shall be saved, Israel shall dwell safely. In a few verses, in a few chapters from here in 31, 31, he's going to be talking about the new covenant that will be made with Israel. Not like the covenant that he made with their fathers, but this one shall be written in their hearts. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33, which is, a, uh, uh, which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8. Zechariah, a book that we spend a lot of time with, and I appreciate our efforts on that. That's a difficult book to say the least. 
You have it's the most messianic. It's also the most apocalyptic book in all of the Old Covenant. And notice Zechariah picks up a, a passage that we've already alluded to. And this is why I'm saying if you write in your Bibles, it's nice to know that Psalms 110 and Zechariah 6, 12, and 13 are talking about the same thing. I like to reverse it as well. I'll go over to Zechariah 6 and write down Psalms 110 because I want to know that those are parallel. And if it doesn't say it, I'd go ahead and throw Acts 2 in there because that's exactly what Peter is preaching. As a matter of fact, he uses Psalms 110 in that sermon. Notice he says, And speaking to him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord, there's the covenant name of hosts, Behold the man whose name is, notice the all caps branch, talking about the Christ. He shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear his glory, notice, and he shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. Boy, that line didn't make it on this one, did it? It's supposed to be under priest. He's going to sit and rule king, and he's going to be a priest, and both of those offices he is going to conduct while sitting on his throne, something that couldn't happen under the old law. You can't be a priest and a king being from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levi. Well, he's all go on and develop. The people of Jesus today were anticipating this. Remember that? We already read these two verses. The woman says, we know that when Messiah come, he's going to show us all things. Jesus says, I'm him. He claimed to be the prophet. Notice John 8, 26, and have many things to say and to judge of you. But he sent, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. If you wanted a definition for Navi, which is the Hebrew word for prophet, that is it. To speak the words that have been given unto you. Remember Micaiah, when called before the court of Ahab and Jehoshaphat, they said, hey, you know, <laughs> would you lighten up and speak like the rest of the prophets and tell Ahab what a great thing this is, you know, how wonderful everything is and how they can go out and fight that battle. And Micaiah says, as the Lord liveth, I can only say what he tells me to say. That's the idea of a prophet. Thus fulfilling the words of Moses. Notice John 12, 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He claimed to be God. We looked at this in the last lesson. Uh, thus fulfilling the words of David. Notice, that's the reason they wanted to kill him. Kill him. Remember, Jesus said, which miracle did I perform that you want to kill me for? They, the Jews, sought him the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Before he claimed to be king. Do you remember before Pilate? He says, Jesus answered, my kingdom's not of this world. Because Pilate asked him, are you a king then? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. That I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. And Pilate said unto him, art thou a king then? Jesus said, thou sayest that I am a king. To this end, notice, was I born. This is the reason I was born, to be a king. And for this cause came I into the world, to be king, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. But the type of king that Jesus was going to be was one that would go back to heaven and rule and reign with his father, a spiritual kingdom established here on this earth as recorded by Isaiah 2, Joel 2, Daniel 2, Micah 4, and fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. As a matter of fact, you remember in Acts chapter 7, the dying declaration of Stephen was that he had seen the Lord standing on the right hand of God, if you will. Jesus came to this world to be king. He is king. He is ruling and reigning now in heaven with God. That's not what the Jews were expecting. No, he didn't fulfill their ideas. You see, he claimed to be shepherd as well, thus fulfilling Micah's words. John 10 at verse 11. You have seven I am statements in the book of John. John 6, 35, I am the bread. John 8, I believe it's 12, Jesus says that I am the light. John 10 at verse 9, he says I'm the door. 10 at verse 11, he says I am the good shepherd. 11, 25, he'll say that I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, he'll say I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John 15, 1, he'll say I am the true vine. Here, I believe, in the fourth statement of the I am's of the book of John, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. Claiming to be that shepherd, the one that Micah said, that's what he's going to be like. And Jesus was that 
Thus, uh, notice he claimed to be Savior, thus fulfilling Jeremiah's words. John 12, 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on believe me believeth not on me, but him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light in the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That is a theme throughout the book of John. Not only in the prologue, but in Jesus' personal ministry and also his public ministry. Jesus says, I am the light. And yet men chose darkness more than light. He says, if you believe on me, you should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus says, I am here to save the world, not to, you know, to, uh, accuse people and, and, and judge people and destroy people now. Remember when James and John were upset because those sorry Samaritans wouldn't let them come through. What did they say? Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven now? He says, oh, you don't know of what spirit you are of. No, we're here to save people. You know, the unfortunate thing is that when Jesus comes again, he's not coming back as the Savior. As a matter of fact, he's coming back to judge the world. He's coming back to destroy the world. He is coming back to punish those, to have vengeance on them who have not obeyed the gospel and believe not that he is the Christ. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, verses one, uh, excuse me, uh, 7 through 9. Or is it 5 through 7? Ah. Claim to function as priest. Notice, thus fulfilling the writings of Zechariah and David. Notice. Jesus saith to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father. You can't get to God without me, is what Jesus is saying in John chapter 14 at verse 6. Yet the Jews said, yes, we can. In John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus says, if you believe not that I am he, you will die in your sins. And I don't care what any modern day denominational preacher says, those are the words of Christ Jesus says, if you don't believe that I am the Messiah, the anointed one, what we're talking about this morning, you will die in your sins. Jesus claimed to be the priest, the way, the truth, and the life. These are just some of the fulfilled prophecies that we could look at just even in the book of John. These would certainly get the attention of people in Jesus' day. Notice what the people said. But lo, he speaketh boldly, they're talking about the Christ. And they, they say nothing unto him, the leaders. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christos, the Messiah? Do they know that and they're just not telling us is the idea? Do we believe Messiah? And brethren, now let's bring this lesson home. Boy, it's easy to get after them Jews, you know. Boy, I couldn't believe you stand right there in front of them. Couldn't they read Isaiah 53 and see the suffering servant, him not opening his mouth and so on? What about us? When we look at Christ, is he our prophet? Do we listen to him? When he gives us the way that we should live our life to put him first and foremost, that he that hateth, not, uh, hateth uh, not his mother and father cannot come unto me. Take up your cross daily. Do we listen to God? Do we listen to Jesus as our prophet? As our God, do we submit and worship? Well, you're here this morning. It's a good start. As our king, do we grant him rule in our lives? In other words, is he first and foremost? Do we put him first? As our shepherd, do we follow and trust and allow him to feed and take care of us? And as our Savior, do we depend on him for our salvation? And last but not least, as our priest, do we use him to approach to our Heavenly Father? Do we pray to God like we should in the name of the Christ, who is our priest, serves in that function to offer our petitions before God? If not, unless we allow Jesus all these things in our lives, we can't truly say that we're his, and we're really no better than those Jews who, standing in their presence, standing in his presence, could not see him for all the blind prejudice that they had. If you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. It's simple. You've got to know who he is. So that's how you develop faith. You hear who the Christ is. You hear about him. You hear the, the things of him. In fact, John says, I wrote this book so that you could believe. And that believing you can have life through his name. That comes by hearing. Hearing develops that faith. Once we have the faith and understanding that Jesus is the Christ, are we willing to stand before men and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ? You see, that's not as easy as it might have been 50 years ago. People will ridicule you now for that. Didn't used to. They'll get after you now. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to repent, to change the way we live our lives and put Jesus first in our lives? 
If so, then there's nothing keeping us from being baptized, being immersed in water for the remission of our sins, the faith in the operation of God, Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, and being raised to walk a new creature, Romans chapter 6. If we can help you at all, we encourage you to come. As together we stand while we sing. I am with all the wandering angels.